Amazing. Well, thank you everyone for joining today's session. We're very excited to have you here today. Um, joining us today is an amazing speaker. She's awesome. Her name's Adirupa Saha. She is a postdoctoral researcher at Microsoft Research in New York City. She completed her PhD from the Department of Computer Science, um, the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, during which she also interned at Microsoft Research in Bangalore, India, Paris, and Google AI in, Mount in Mountain View. Her research interests include bandits and reinforcement learning, optimization, learning theory, algorithm analysis, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So that's all about her, but I'll let her talk about herself in a bit. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to share a couple of things. So today's session is being recorded. So if you wanted to come back and watch this video later on and maybe go through some other modules or anything related to today's session, we'll definitely be able to do that. Um, I'll be pasting a lot of links in the chat that Adirupa will be referring to. So you can just take a look there. Um, please keep in mind that the chat is viewable by all of us and everyone else. So just be respectful to all speakers and your fellow attendees. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to also share that we do have a code of conduct that I'll paste in the chat and a check-in link that I'll also paste in the chat. And if you could just check in there, it gives you access to all the links all in one place. So you don't have to go around looking for them. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Adirupa. Uh, well, thank, thanks so much, Eamon. And um, so uh, just one thing, if somebody has a question, so please put it in the chat. I can't monitor the chat, so Eamon would be able to uh, just uh, uh, forward those questions to me, and I'll be happy to answer. Yeah, that's, um, yeah. that's a good point, Adarupa. So yes, please keep the comments in the chat. Um, as they come up, I'll just say them out loud for Adarupa. She can um, respond to them there, or we can all take them up at the end of the session as well. Yes. All right. Uh, sounds good. So uh, thanks so much, Eamon. And uh, uh, hey, everyone, Like, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, your time uh, and making it here today for the session. I hope all of you are doing great. And uh, so I'm just, as Eamon said, I'm just a postdoctoral researcher at Microsoft Research New York City right now and doing some research on broadly on machine learning and AI, but it's a subpart bandits and reinforcement learning where I uh, mostly work on. So we'll come to this. So, okay, so let's start with the talk maybe. Uh, so I promise this, this talk is going to be on bandits and I'll keep my promise on that. But before that, uh, uh, what is even there to learn about bandits? I mean, we know that uh, these things are like, these are bad influences, generally rob people, uh, safer to stay away from, but how can that be a topic for uh, data science and a uh, machine learning uh, tutorial? All right, so uh, so let's do some warm up here, maybe. Uh, so we are really not going to talk about robbers or gangsters, to be honest. I mean, at least not directly, but indirectly in some sense. We'll come to it in a moment. Um, but by bandits, we actually refer to a subfield of machine learning, um, and there is a whole bunch of literature that that's, that's being developed uh, since the last 40, 50 years, or maybe maybe even. Uh, earlier than that. Uh, so um, it's a subfield of machine learning and probably there, there are a lot of data scientists, applied machine learning engineers, uh, graduate students and undergrads here who are probably already aware of the field of machine learning a bit, machine learning and AI. Uh, so we all know that uh, broadly the objective of machine learning literature is to uh, try to teach uh, our machines, learn like humans and uh, teach them from some earlier data, some history, some past records, some evidence, some sort of uh, observations. So uh, what does ML teach us? Uh, so we are in the world of data and it conveys the trend of learning or some predictions task. So more formally, uh, the machine learning algorithm, basically it, it is basically some, some black box which takes input data and um, throws away a prediction model. Uh, so given some past observations, it tries to predict uh, how uh, a future observation or, or, or a particular kind of uh, specific specimen is going to look like um, for a particular predictions task. 
right? So it tries to exploit pattern or uh, some relationship or dependencies on hidden, hidden structure for some sort of prediction task in mind. So some examples uh, would make it clearer and who, who doesn't know about spam filtering. So what is the predictions task here? It's basically get some emails uh, as the objects or ident uh, entities and try to understand whether the email is a spam, should it uh, or not. So should it should we forward it as, as a mailbox handler system? Should we forward the email to your inbox or just mark it as a spam and delete it or spam it in your, or put it to your spam folder? Uh, so um, definitely, how does it work? Uh, generally, generally speaking, very generally speaking, we try to characterize the emails through the features of the words or placement of the words, a particular occurrence of words, email IDs. And uh, th those are the indications uh, for us, for us humans to understand at least it's spam or not. We are trying to teach the machines also the similar way through those indicators and learn them in a more technical, I mean, teach them in a more technical way to understand whether a particular email is spam or not. For that, uh, the system actually has to study or we have to feed the system a lot of earlier emails and we have to specifically mark them, uh, teach them, show them that, look, this email contains this is this kind of words and it's a, it's a spam, this is a spam, this is a spam. These are the emails which are not spam, not spam, not spam. So the system already has a huge chunk of data available. Some of them are categorized as spam, some of them are not. Now, when a new email comes, uh, just by pattern matching or some some sort of you know uh, recognition of the earlier uh, pattern or relationship or hidden structure in the emails uh, the system is intelligent enough to most correct i mean most probably correctly able to detect whether it was a spam or not so that's all about spam filtering similarly there, there is like machine learning is everywhere so i don't really need to give examples here so just maybe one more because there's some nice pictures here <laughs> so about leak predictions so uh, so, so maybe there's so some some of us might have already seen these are coming on headlines that supercomputer gives prediction for uh, various uh, winner of various leaks uh, and how do they do this? This is just by observing the past trends of how many times a team is winning, losing, uh, how are they competing against other, just observing the past uh, performance of the tree team and history uh, it tries to predict what's going to happen in the future. Okay, so that's all about having a particular data set already in hand, having some record, having some offline data, some chunk of bunch batch data already in hand. And now the task is, well, uh, given a new observation or a new entity, we just need to uh, classify that in which category or which prediction it belongs to, which category it belongs to. But what if we don't have any data to start with? It's like completely, we just don't have any data to start with. We have to do it in an online fashion. For example, generally, I mean, when a system has to start, it's, it's, a, it's an online spam filtering process. For example, uh, Suppose, suppose the we don't have the earlier data in hand because the trend changes over time. Uh, some 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 new kind of emails may show up which were not spam earlier. So those those tasks are going to uh, the earlier prediction models are going to be failed if they were trained on the earlier data. But uh, the new data, the trends has changed, and we are just using the earlier data. So we have to keep on updating our model in a very online fashion, in a very online sequential fashion so that we keep up to date with the trend, uh, with, the, uh, with the observation trend, with the prediction trend, and um, update our model through each data. So what is the online sequential process? Uh, the data is a tree streaming data. So every time an observation comes, so every time, say, uh, you show me a fruit, I have to say it's an apple or an orange. Or if every time an email comes, I have to say it's a spam or a not spam. I get a feedback whether I was correct or not. And then the other email comes. I don't have a batch data in my hand through which I have already, I already have a pre-trend model and I can just use that model to predict, predict the future emails, it's not going to happen. So I have to learn in continually, incessantly um, in an online fashion. So that's that's about online learning. So these things are very, very, very useful 
in most of the realistic scenarios because nothing is stationary i mean it is it is very unrealistic to believe that there would be a data which is already there would be a past data we don't know when it was collected it might not be up to date and uh hello um can everyone uh, yeah we can still hear you adirupa and the problem is uh, my screen is not working it seems like <laughs> All good. Uh, we'll wait till you figure it out. Um, can you try maybe flipping a slide? No, the problem is it has blanked out completely. Oh my oh, god, that's weird. Oh uh, my god. No worries, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> I probably, I mean, uh, do you want to try maybe um, turning on your taskmaster? Maybe no, nothing is working. Uh, I probably have to like restart it. That's okay. We'll be here. It'll just take a second. Um, so yeah, you can leave the call and then join again. Okay, we'll take I'm a little very, break. Very, very sorry. All about good. This. <laughs> All good. Technical difficulties always happen. All right. We'll see you in a couple minutes, everybody. Feel free to restart yeah. and join yeah. again. For everyone in the chat, thank you for bearing with us. We'll just uh, take a minute. I'm sure things happen. Adri was also joining us from India, so it's a little bit farther away um, and things happen. So all good. Thank you for bearing with us. Just take a little bit of a short break. All right. If you'd like to go ahead and grab a drink of water or take a trip to the restroom, that's fine too. Um, I'll definitely give another call back as soon as she's back. Oh, there she goes. <laughs> so she should be here pretty soon. Give her a couple minutes. Hi, Deruba. All set? Hi. 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 All right. Can you share your Sorry. screen again? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen? Uh, it's just coming on now. Let's give yes. it a couple of seconds. That was pretty fast. Your device actually rebooted pretty quickly. I know when I have to restart it, it's like a five minute process but no it's, i don't know why it behaved so weirdly like it it, it happened only <laughs> once before and it gets it the screen gets totally blanked out i'm, I'm so oh, sorry no. everyone, everyone. <laughs> all good so, everyone. no worries thanks you, you know it's always Amazing. when you least want it to happen is when everything goes wrong so don't worry <laughs> about it um okay great so for the recording we'll just cut out this little break so it flows smoothly um, for those on the chat, thank you so much for bearing with us. And Adripa, you can continue on as before. I'll remove myself now. Okay.
Thanks, thanks a lot, Heyman. Uh, so yeah, so uh, we were talking about this online sequential uh, learning process where data is not available in hand and it comes uh, one by one in a sequential fashion, which is very, very realistic in most of the real world applications, for example, in clinical trials. Um, so we want to understand whether a drug is going to be um, useful for a particular disease or not. So now the thing is, we cannot ask as a system designer or algorithm designer, we cannot ask all the patients to fall sick at the same time and uh, provide them the drug to each of them and see that whether it worked for this patient and this patient and this patient and didn't work for this patient. So we just really don't have a way to collect this data beforehand before uh, trying this drug. And these things are very crucial. I mean, this, these things are like health. So it's a very important decision. So when a new patient comes, you want to predict it's going to work or not. Uh, we have to be careful. So the algorithms need, need to be not only just uh, efficient, it should be re reliable and online. Uh, so, so clinical trials is definitely one of the examples where we want to use online learning and not, not a conventional batch learning uh, as we generally do in machine learning. Uh, same goes with stock market predictions. I'll just flush some of nice some of the nice pictures here because uh, mostly we all know what is stock market. There are like stock prices and we the machine, the system need to predict uh, what the stock price of a particular um, what is the price of a particular stock is going to be tomorrow or yesterday after uh, tomorrow seeing the data from yesterday so it every day we see some data and next day we have to predict about it so it's an incessant con continual learning process similarly if we are trying to suppose we are commuting from our office to work and um, work to work to back home and we just don't know first day which way to go and we have a couple of options to try, try from so we'll uh, first try a particular route and maybe it took some certain amount of uh, time and certain amount of congestion that we faced um, then uh, we'll try another route next day uh, we'll evaluate uh, a reward quote unquote reward that uh, how much how much time did it take how much congestion we faced how much cost we had to incur in the process a reward would be a combination of that and uh, doing this process continually for some days we have to uh, fix converge to a best commute uh, commute route but uh, Throughout this process, we'll be incurring those costs. So if we don't have a batch data again, it's an online sequential process. Similarly, in search engine optimization, definitely it's very important that every time a user comes, they give a search, a keyword to search from, and there are several results showing up. Uh, the, the, the website itself keeps changing every time. So we have to keep on updating our model all the time. We can't just rely on a fixed particular a uh, sort of prediction or history or pattern we have observed in the past and just stick to that model. We have to learn incessantly. Uh, so <laughs> here comes the probably the most, uh, one of the most uh, widely used application of uh, uh, online sequential learning. Uh, this is actually um, some introduction to bandits, which I was talking about in the to, in the beginning. So uh, probably I, uh, we are seeing some cas casino machines in the slides. And uh, these are basically some slot machines. If you pull a lever, you put some money, you pull a lever and some uh, amount shows up. So forget about putting some money. Uh, so suppose you just don't have to put any money, you just pull some lever. So basically the task is to understand out of this five levers, which of the liver you want to pull so that highest amount of, you gain highest amount of reward, but you don't have a batch data. Okay, so just try to relate it to the earlier examples we have seen. For example, this five mis machines are like five paths from your home to office, and you just don't know which path will give you the highest reward. So you have to go on trying each of them, right? So what you will do here is, Probably, okay, assume that there are there are some underlying rewards associated to each of these machines. For example, there are some under, underlying rewards associated to each of the commute paths, right? And we just don't know what is what. So um, 
uh, we definitely have no idea about this underlying rewards. I'm just showing that maybe dollar eleven a reward is associated to arm one, associated to arm three, a dollar. You have to pay dollar three if you pull arm two, uh, which is really terrible. Um, so the last arm seems like the best arm because it gives you dollar twenty seven, which is the highest arm with the highest reward. So uh, had I told you about the actual rewards of the arms, there would have been nothing to learn. You would, we would always have been pulling the fifth arm because it's the best arm, we can see it. But definitely the reward structure is not known to us. And the problem of bandits or, is to basically understand this. So summing up more technically and more simplifying, just generalizing all these examples that we talked about here and numerous other examples uh, sitting in the real world, it's basically a prediction task of converging to the best term. Now this best is defined in terms of some reward and the reward is defined in terms of the based, based on the system needs. Uh, okay, so uh, if it is a commute system, then it is the need, the need, uh, the need, the reward would be defined in terms of commuting time, commuting cost, congestion, how much you were fat fatigued in the process, all of this. If it was a stock market, then how much money you put, how much money you gained, all this, uh, and how much time you lost in the process, all these things combinedly would, would define a reward. So uh, assume that there are some n number of arms, and there are some associ underlying associated rewards to these arms, mu1, mu2, up to mu n. And what we don't know, a is uh, what is mu1, what is mu2, what is mu1. As a learner, we don't know it. But assume, uh, we'll assume that as if without loss of generality, always mu1 is the arm which has the highest reward. So R1 is the arm which always has the highest reward. Now, uh, but as a learner, we don't know it. So our goal is to basically figure out the arm which has the highest reward, which is basically arm1. Uh, the game is now when you pull a lever, so you don't get to see a noiseless reward. Otherwise, you have to just pull every arm. You have to do this exercise n times. You will figure out what is mu1, what is mu2, and you're done. You know all the values mu1, mu2, mu1, and you know which one has the highest, highest reward. But these observations are noisy. What I mean by that is this is an online sequential process. So at every round, as I said, like we are standing in front of five slot machines. At every round, we pull a slot machine. We don't get to see exactly the reward associated to it, but some noisy reward, okay? With the mean, uh, with the, the, the mean of the reward could be actually $1 or $1.27, but we don't see exactly the mean. We see some noisy version of it. To be more precise, suppose we draw the arm 80 uh, from the in, uh, arm indices one to n, and um, upon which we get to see a noisy reward, RT, which comes from some distribution with mean mu 80. So these distributions could be, suppose we have only three arms, okay? So N capital N is equal to three. So R1 could have like this distribution, which is basically um, a normal distribution. As you can see, this one is kind of a normal distribution with a mean 0 0.6 okay so this has the highest mean as i said the best uh, the first arm will assume the first arm would have highest mean the second arm has another normal like it's almost like normal or a beta it's, it's a normal distribution sort of um or a beta uh, with a mean 0 0.4 and the third arm has a uniform reward. Okay, so the reward is reward can be is uniformly distributed anywhere between zero and one. Um, so it has a mean reward uh, 0.5. But uh, the issue is uh, when so when we draw arm three, definitely we don't know where exactly the reward lies. It is 0.5 or whatever it is. So the the task is to basically learn what is the mean reward. And once we learn it, we can learn to play the converge to the best arm. And um, okay, uh, so how do we measure the regret? More technically, if arm one has the highest reward and I am playing, we are playing arm 80 at round T. So at every round, small t, we incur a cost of mu one minus mu 80, or rather it's like a loss because we could have achieved a reward of mu1 had we had played the 
the best arm, which is mu one, but we actually played something mu at, which are off by the additive factor of mu mu one minus mu at. So that's like my cost or penalty summed over all t rounds, some capital t many number of rounds, uh, for which I am playing the gambling game. Um, it's basically gives me my total loss. So for example, if my at is terrible, so if uh, the best arm has a reward of 0.9 or 0 0.7, um, 0 0.7, for example, as we saw in the earlier picture. And uh, I am playing an arm which has, say, mu AT is 0.1 or something. Every round, I'm incurring a cost of 0.6, which means after the end of T round, I'm incurring a 0.6 capital T regret, which is huge, which is like a linear regret. But if suppose I am playing uh, AT equal to arm 1 from the very beginning, then I incur zero regret. So the this is basically actually called the pseudo regret. It is not really important because uh, we are evaluated in terms of the expected regret. So we are not really, the, when we pull arm AT, we don't really see the reward mu AT. We see a noisy version, as I mentioned. We see a noisy version, but we evaluate on, on the expected value of the reward itself. So this is called the pseudo regret. Um, but this is good enough. We don't need to go to the technicality of actual regret and pseudo regret and all those things. Um, so all we have want to do is if RT is defined like this, this is my T round regret. I want to find an algorithm uh, whose regret at least converge to zero in the infinite in the limit of infinite time. So if I had a, at least as a learner, if I had a chance to query from that underlying model, many, many number of times, potentially infinitely many number of times, then eventually I should be able to converge to the best arm and I should go on pulling the best arm because otherwise this, this uh, inequality, I mean, this limit will never hold unless I can converge to the best arm or keep on pulling the best arm sufficiently many number of times in the, in the event of long run, this is not going to converge to zero. Um, so that's like the, reasonable objective for the system designers or the uh, learners. Now, uh, this entire game is called multi-arm bandit, K-N-R multi-arm bandit. And why is it called bandit in general? So, because bandits robs money, okay? And this, this example, this problem formulation was generated or formulated keeping in mind keeping in mind about the gambling game. I mean, this is the gambling game was one of the main reason why this uh, multi-arm bandit problem was formulated in the past. So that's how the name bandit came uh, from there. So it's relevant to, to, to its actual meaning, but uh, it is more useful rather than being more scary. Okay, so <clears throat> if someone has a question at this point of time, I can take a pause for say a minute and I can try to understand if there is a question, please put it in the chat because we are going to just now switch the gear a bit and try to see what are some good algorithms to solve this multi-arm bandit problem. So I'll talk about say some, some easy, easy algorithms here, but then I'll put a reference for several different algorithms which are available for several different generalization and extensions of this online sequential learning game and uh, some more uh, recent developments, some more recent areas of research. And also if uh, if there are like somebody who's interested in coding up this algorithm, there will be also links to the Python codes or um, in, in the GitHub repositories from where you will be able to derive, I mean, get the implementation codes if needed. So if there are questions, please feel free to uh, put it in the chat. Okay. Uh, so in the meanwhile, I'll proceed um, because we already lost some time between. So um, say if the rewards were known, uh, we already know which is the best time to put. Okay. So there is nothing to do. But um, if suppose the rewards are not known, then uh, we have to do some explore exploitation trade-off. So basically, if we have n arms, and uh, we have to pull every arm sufficiently many number of times before discarding them out that those arms are not the good ones. Because if we don't pull a particular arm, 
who knows that might be the arm with the highest reward so we have to explore all the arm but at the same time we cannot go on blindly exploring all the arms with uniform like we cannot design an algorithm which picks all the arm with uniform probability one by n which is going to be a terrible algorithm because uh, it's going to have like a linear regret over time it, it it is not going to converge to the best arm so the idea is to basically explore sufficiently enough but at the same time also try to understand which is a good arm with some estimate with some sort of learning procedure uh, once we become more and more sure about which is a good arm try to pull that arm more and try to explore less so it's like how much you explore and how much you exploit uh, you cannot survive without one, you have to do both, but really the your performance depends on how you balance these two things. So here is one very naive algorithm, which is called an epsilon greedy algorithm. So what this algorithm does is, it's a very, very naive algorithm. So what it does is, it, it initially just explore for some epsilon t many number of times uh, with some, some epsilon, which, uh, which is a problem parameter. So it just explore, like pull every arm for the first epsilon t many number of rounds. And then uh, it computes the, uh, it computes the mean rewards of every arm. So mu i, mu i hat of any small t is basically a, a measure of the expected reward of arm i after small t many number of rounds. So it's the total accumulated reward of arm i divided, oops, uh, divided by the total number of time arm i was pulled, which is capital T i t is the total number of time arm i was pulled. And the numerator is basically the total accumulated reward of arm i in the capital T i t many number of times. So this is the empirical beam of arm i in small t many number of rounds. And um, we explore all the arms uniformly for the first cap epsilon t many number of rounds. And then we just converge, we just keep on pulling the arm which has the highest empirical mean for the rest of the rounds. So what that means is this is also equivalent to equivalently, I can also design an algorithm which always at every round uh, with probability epsilon, it basically explore all the arm with probability one by n. So that's what it is showing that at the start of every n with probability epsilon, it just explores every arm with probability one by n. And with probability one minus epsilon, it just pulls the arm which has the highest highest empirical mean. Uh, these two algorithms are like equivalent. So in the picture, I'm just showing the version where with probability epsilon, I'm pulling the arm, uh, I'm pulling the arms uniformly or probability one minus epsilon, I'm just uh, sticking the arm with the highest empirical mean. This algorithm is not so good as it sounds like, because in the initial epsilon t many number of times, I'm just uniformly exploring arms, which means that I can have, I can be pulling very terrible arms, which has like uh, very small rewards. And my regret at, at every round is going to be order one, which means that at least for the first epsilon t many number of rounds, I'm going to incur a regret of order one in the worst case, which means already I have a regret of epsilon t. Already I have a regret of epsilon t here. And if epsilon is like high enough, for example, suppose we choose epsilon to be something like, even if it is a constant, for example, we choose epsilon to be 0.1 or we choose epsilon to be 0 0.001, even then this is an order t term. Okay, so we are failing terribly because we want actually, um, you remember the limit notation, it's limit RT by T should go to zero. But if it is order, if it, even if it is 0 0.0001 or any constant times one epsilon, then the ultimate regret is that constant time T. So the, the fraction doesn't go to zero in the limit. So we are failing at it. So we have to, we have no other option but to choose epsilon, which is a time varying epsilon. So it turns out that if we choose epsilon t to be something which is going down with time, which is like n to the one by three t to the t to the minus one by three, which is any any exploration rate which go, decays with time. So as we proceed along in the time horizon, we should explore less, exploit more. 
which makes perfect sense that initially we start with a very high epsilon. Um, initially t is small, so epsilon t is large. So we explore a lot more because we have hardly any knowledge about the arms. So we pull the arms uniformly more often. But as we go along, we have better estimates of the empirical means. We became more confident, so we don't need to explore so much. We can rather stick to the arm which has the highest empirical mean, and more most likely because it's a stochastic model, um, it's going to be the arm with the highest reward. By the way, for all this all this results, whenever I'm showing the regret guarantee, so this algorithm is known to have a regret guarantee of n to the one third, t to the two third. Note that RT by T actually is n to the one third by T to the one third here, which actually goes to zero in the limit of infinite time, infinite T, which is good. Uh, but though the rate is not so good because it is going to zero at the rate of T to the minus one third, which is kind of a slow rate. Can we improve the rate a bit more? Can we get something like T to the minus uh, to the minus half rather than to the minus one third, which is definitely a faster rate. So we want this term to go to zero as quickly as possible. Now, whenever I'm flushing any result or I'm saying it's a time varying epsilon, it's uh, this much of regret, I'm always assuming that the underlying banded instance has n number of arms and they all has Bernoulli rewards. Okay, so we have results also for other kind of reward distributions for the arms, but for the time of, for the interest of this talk, I'll always assume that the underlying arms has Bernoulli rewards with parameter mu1, mu2, mu k. So if you pull arm, say i, then with probability uh, mu i, you get to see a reward of one. With probability one minus mu i, you get to see a reward of zero. So that is the underlying stochastic reward structure we are assuming and for which this results are true. And um, this algorithm, though uh, converging fast, it's a very efficient algorithm. It is actually used a lot in practice, to be very honest, because it's very efficiently implementable. But it has a worse regret guarantee in, in the sense like the regret is not going to zero very fast. So there is another elegant algorithm, which is called the upper confidence bound algorithm or UCB algorithm, uh, which is widely used in the literature, in the online learning or online learning literature or banded literature. Um, uh, which gives the optimal rate t to the minus one, one half. And it has been proven also that for this problem of multi arm bandit, no algorithm can do better than t to the minus one half regret rate for worst case problem instances. For example, we can always construct Bernoulli uh, problem instances, MAB problem instances with capital N many number of arms, uh, all with Bernoulli rewards. And there exists some, so no matter what algorithm you come up with, no matter what learning algorithm you come up with, there I can always construct a bad example, um, bad MAB example, where your algorithm has to incur a regret rate of t to the minus one half at least. So this algorithm is optimal in that sense. So what is, what is this algorithm doing really? So suppose what I'm showing here in the y-axis is basically the arm index indices, uh, oh, sorry, in the x-axis, I'm basically showing the arm indices. In the y-axis, I'm just showing the true means of the arms. So um, can someone tell me which arm has the highest reward here? Uh, just, just to make sure that I'm making sense. So in the y-axis, I'm just plotting that uh, what is the mean reward of the arm? So we, I have five arms, uh, blue, the violet, the pink, the green, the yellow, and these are the mean rewards of the arms. So can someone tell me that which is the best arm actually? Which is the arm we want to converge to? Uh, very quickly, uh, it's, it should be like simple. Um, no comments just yet, Adirupa. Okay, okay. Um, so probably uh, I'll, I'll, I'll move forward in the interest of the talk. Um, so the arm which has the highest reward is basically the arm which has uh, the highest y value, which is basically arm five. Um, now the issue is where. Um, oh, okay, okay. So uh, what happens is basically how this algorithm proceeds. So the algorithm basically does, doesn't have any idea about the true rewards of the arms. So what it tries to do is 
um, it tries to estimate, start with some estimated mean reward, which is denoted by this red dots. So it, it assumes that all the arms mean rewards are same, which is somewhere in 0.5. Everything has a mean reward of 0.5. Every Bernoulli instance has a mean reward of 0.5. And then it tries to build a confidence interval around the mean reward. The hope is that the true reward will always lie inside the confidence interval. So for this gray boxes, these are like the confidence intervals. And the red dots are basically the estimated means. The, 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 the thick bar, the solid lines are the true means. See, the confidence intervals are always good enough that it is covering, they are, they are always covering all the, all the solid lines within them, within the confidence box. So we have to initially start with a very high confidence if we are starting with uniform mean. Okay, so build, build confidence intervals. And now what do we do is, basically it's, it's a process of pulling an arm which has the highest optimistic reward. For example, I can pull an arm, um, say arm three, which has the highest reward. So the solid line, uh, which has the, the top portion of the solid line is basically the maximum the reward of this arm can be. So I'll just pull arm three here. Uh, what would happen after pulling arm three is I will uh, somehow I can't see it. Uh, okay, there was a clip here, but it's not playing very well. Uh, the clip is getting struck, so I'm just not able to show the animation. But anyways, um, it's 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 not so important. So uh, we'll just pull uh, some arm arm three maybe, and uh, we'll try to reduce the confidence interval as we see the reward of the arms. But yeah, this clip is not working, seems like. Okay, there are lots of technical problems here. Um, so I'll just go uh, more algorithmically. So every time uh, we'll start with some initial estimate of the mean rewards, which is like mu hat i small t. Initially, mu hat i1 is 0.5 for everyone. And we'll build the confidence interval plus, plus CIT minus CIT. Um, we'll always pull the arm, which has the highest mu it plus CIT, so which has the highest optimistic reward estimate. Now, what would happen is once we see the, once we pull an arm, we see the reward of the arm. So its mean reward is going to change because if an arm actually has a bad reward, bad actual mean, its observed reward is also going to be less. So the estimated mean reward is going to fall down. So it's estimated upper confidence bound is also going to fall down. So we'll rather not play that arm in the next round, we'll play an arm which has a higher upper confidence bound. And that's how the algorithm proceeds. Uh, the algorithm is known to have a regret of square root nt instead of n to the one third t to the two third n to the one third t to the two third guarantee that we see earlier, and this is definitely a better convergence rate because this algorithm goes to the regret of this algorithm goes to zero with the rate of t to the minus half, which is a faster rate than t to the minus one third that we saw for the epsilon greedy algorithm. There is also another algorithm which is called the Thompson sampling algorithm. <laughs> this algorithm is is like uh, this algorithm has some uh, um, advantage in terms of the fact that it does not need to maintain any upper confidence bound the way we were maintaining for the earlier rounds. So what it does it it maintains uh, it 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 assumes that every every uh, underlying reward distribution um, it assumes some underlying reward distribution for every arm. So for example, suppose uh, it assumes that the rewards are normal with certain means for arm one, arm two, arm three. So uh, the blue one has some normal uh, 0 0.1, the green has some normal distribution 0 0.5, the blue, uh, the yellow has some normal distribution with mean 0 0.7 and so on. Now they will uh, sample an a, a, a noisy reward, a sample, a, a value randomly from each of this distribution, as if like we have our um, our model that we believe is the actual reward distribution for the underlying arms, though we don't know what the actual reward distribution is. We'll, we'll behave, we'll pretend as if we know it. We'll start with some initial reward distribution. We'll sample a reward from each of this distribution. And um, again, I had a clip clip here, but probably I'll not be able to like run the clip. Um, 
because yeah, I'm not able to run the clip. So what would happen is um, I'll just uh, describe by the algorithm I have here. So assume we we can assume like some beta priors for all the arms. So we can assume that every arm um, is is some like uh, it, it has a beta prior and we know that beta and Bernoulli, I don't know whoever is aware of it, beta and Bernoulli are conjugate prior distributions. So the arm rewards are Bernoulli distribution. We assume that the Bernoulli parameters has a beta prior. So we can initially start with a uniform prior for all the arms and um, we can then uh, sample um, rewards from each of the arms assuming that this prior knowledge is true. But once we see sampled arms, we pull the arm which has the highest sample reward. So get the reward RT by playing each arm. And then uh, which of the arm, so after we see the outcome, we basically update the prior. So we pull an arm which has the highest sample reward. And uh, once we see the outcome, we can update the prior to some posterior distribution. So we have now posterior beta distributions and we'll go on doing this um, until uh, until T rounds. Uh, the issue, the issue, the good thing about this algorithm is it doesn't have to maintain UCV estimates and it's, it's oftentimes computationally much more efficient, at least for the Bernoulli distributions as we can see it. Uh, although it is still, um, efficient in the sense it still has the same regret convergence rate of t to the minus one half that we saw for the UCB algorithm. Now, uh, there are also um, instances so far we were talking about, so again, I'm changing the gear a bit here. So, so far I have been talking about only uh, instances of bandits where we know the arm rewards are stochastic. So there is already some underlying distributions from which the rewards are being generated and um, we just have to converge to the arm which has the highest expected mean reward. But what happens if the rewards are adversarial, as if like the underlying arm rewards are changing every time or the reward distributions of each arm is changing every time in an adversarial fashion? Uh, it's possible, right? Because mostly in real world scenarios, it's hardly the case that uh, always the, um, observations or data is generate is being generated from a similar sort of population or a similar sort of environment. The environment itself can change over time, over demography, the season, various variation can happen through which the underlying model can change. So we have to assume some something more restrictive rather than assuming it to be a, simply a stochastic model. So if the model is actually not stochastic, if the underlying rewards of the arms, like mu1, mu2, mu n, uh, these are the expected mean rewards. But if suppose this is changing over time at every round, uh, then, then what do we do? Because the earlier algorithms are bound to fail. They were all stochastic algorithms. They were all trying to maintain estimate of the mean reward or some posterior distribution of the rewards or some you know empirical empirical best arm but all of this is going to fall flat all of this is going to like fail miserably as soon we come out of the stochastic assumption and make all the arms adversarial the arm rewards as adversarial so in which case uh, an, a famously used algorithm is <coughs> excuse me uh, the exp3 algorithm. So what it does it, it doesn't care about maintaining any estimate because it's pointless as we discussed. So what it tries to do is it maintain a weight over the arms. For example, suppose I have an initial weight P1, which is just say I have capital K many number of arms. Okay, total capital K many number of arms and I initialize the weight distribution over the arms to be uniform, one by k, one by k, one by k. So I'm equally likely to pull any of the arms. So these weights are basically a representation of how likely I'm going to pull one of the arm. So I'm equally likely to pull any of the arm from this k arms. However, uh, once I pull an arm, I see basically the loss associated to it or the reward associated to it. So I basically see what is the reward of the arm or uh, minus of the reward is basically the loss. So Ft is basically minus of Rt, the reward that we were seeing. So we see the loss corresponding to that arm. 
and uh, which would be assume some something in zero one. So we we should be able to estimate what is going to be the loss of the other arms if we pull it um, randomly. For example, I mean for those who understand. Uh, conditional expectations. It's not very hard to see that if we do an, uh, this is called inverse propensity scoring or important sampling estimate. If we look at this estimate of f hat s k, it's basically the reward estimate of arm k at round small s. So it's basically f s k divided by p s k, the probability with which arm k was pulled at small time s with an indicator that uh, k equal to k s which is basically k s is basically the arm which was pulled at time small s so with the indicator uh, so this is basically if this might look a bit weird for those who are not aware of it but uh, the expected uh, value of f hat s k given the earlier history is exactly f s k the true reward of arm k at time s. It's not very difficult to show it. So we have a way to get an unbiased estimate of the rewards of every arm at every time. And then all we know, all we have to do is basically to do to update the weights of the algorithm. So as if, if somebody already tells me that what is the reward of each of these arms, because that's what it, this estimate is helping me with. What is the reward of this arm? I can basically try to put more weightage on those arms which has gathered very less number of loss or lot of rewards and i'll reduce the weight on those arms which has gathered uh, a lot of loss but very small number of reward i mean reward is just the minus of the loss so this algorithm basically does that so if pt was the um, distribution at time t pt plus one is basically um, exponentially weighted uh, inversely, uh, I mean, exponentially weighted uh, inversely with the cumulative loss of arm k. So this summation s from 1 to t is basically the total loss accumulated by arm k uh, from round 1 to t. So it's the, like the total loss of arm k. Exponential of minus that loss is basically uh, proportional to its weight. So higher the accumulated loss is, lower would be the weight. And the, the, the denominator is just a normalization factor. We don't really have to worry about the denominator. So the pro, pro weight of every arm is just proportional to, inversely proportional to its accumulated loss, or proportional to its accumulated rewards. And that's the XP tree algorithm. And this algorithm is known to have a, a regret guarantee of square root t, again, which is optimal. Even with, a, even with an adversary, environment, adversarial losses, we are getting an algorithm of square root t. Um, so the link below is basically the link uh, of covering all the three, all the three, four algorithms I covered in the talk, along with the Python implementation. Uh, so if somebody is interested, they can go and check. I'll also give a link of some of the books and uh, reading materials towards the end of the slides, which which you can take a look if somebody's interested in bandits. So these are some regret, how the regret plots look like for different algorithms. If we com compare UCB with TS, Thompson sampling with Epsilon Greedy, um, generally Epsilon Greedy has a higher regret because it explores more. If you look at the UCB algorithm or um, they generally, gen generally tend to have a lower regret. Uh, but this, these are all sublinear regrets, so they are converging to, uh, the, in the limit, they are converging to um, a sublinear term. Now, uh, in the rest of the five five minutes I have, I'll just uh, briefly touch, up, uh, touch on some other interesting areas of research, some other interesting developments that are happening around multi arm bandit. So definitely multi arm bandit, the community has started all sorts of generalizations of multi arm bandits, start, starting with if the number of arms are changing across time, the, the we assume that the arm set n is fixed, but if it is itself changing across time, which is quite realistic, uh, we can invent one more new path, one more new movie can show up, one more new um, uh, stock 
can show up in the market. So the prediction space need not have to be fixed. It can change over time. Or if it is, um, if if we have a budget associated to pulling every arm, maybe we can just, just not pull an arm. It has a budget associated to it or it has a state information associated to it. There are various extensions people have studied. So I'll just talk about two extensions. So one is like, uh, this is kind of very relevant. At least it, in today's world, especially after COVID, now everything is online, the world is virtual. So we go on shopping, right? And what we get to see is a bunch of items from which we are supposed to select a one item or supposed to click on one item or supposed to click one or two items okay um so it's basically not like uh, we are pulling one arm but as a system so this is this is shown by some recommender system platform so they are always showing us a bunch of items together not just one arm and pulling we are pulling that arm and telling the rewards it's more like showing a bunch of items and asking which one do you like the most out of this lot uh, similarly, in movie recommendation systems, for example, say Netflix or uh, any other movie recommendation of your choice, you can assume where um, you want to collect user feedback from a bunch of movies that uh, what, how much do they like a, a particular movie or not, so that you can recommend better movies to them. Um, you can in, you want to increase the revenue by increasing the click, click through rate or the watch time. So. It shows that studies have shown that uh, generally, if we collect information through this relative feedback, it involves lesser bias. It always is easier to collect information because it suffers from less number of user non-response. Uh, so again, uh, just so for example, I, I have two ways to collect data. One is like, I can show a movie to a user or a bunch of movie to a user. And I say, like, could you please rate this movie in a scale of zero to 10, um, this movie A, movie B, movie C. And I can ask them, they might even not answer these questions because rating every every movie in a scale of zero to 10 is a, is a, is a somewhat more tedious task. But what we can ask them is show them a bunch of movie and say, which movie do you like the most? Or just pick your top, top two favorite movies or top three fav favorite movies. And when this was studied, this two kind of different kind of data collection techniques, it has shown, we have we have seen in the study that generally this later technique is much more easier. It is much more con consistent. Users are much more consistent in giving their feedback. And it is, uh, it is a lot more easier to collect data because users tend to answer questions more when uh, questions are asked in a relative scale. So there is a lot of, usefulness of learning from preferences, but this uh, framework really doesn't fit to the multi arm banded framework in a sense, or rather this is like every every arm in the multi arm banded is a subset now because we are we are pulling a subset of arms and that's like an arm and we see only a binary feedback that which arm is going to be the winner or or some indication feedback that this is the winner arm. Uh, so for this this is called a field of preference bandits, which is kind of an extension of, I mean, it's kind of a generalized, or I'll say like, like a brother of actual multi arm bandit problem. It was derived from multi arm bandit, but not actually solvable through multi arm bandit. This is useful in restaurant recommendation, movie recommendation, search engine, crowdsourcing, uh, two player games, multiplayer games, various, various such examples are there. Uh, so yeah, the similar uh, picture is very similar. So now instead of like having uh, pulling one arm, now we are giving the learner the provision to pull a set of some small k many number of arms from a set of capital, the same n many number of arms are there, but we are giving the provision to pull a set of arms, like a set of shoes or a set of movies and pull them as a bunch in every round and show it to the user and the user picks uh, gives you the feedback that which one do they like the most. That's like my feedback. And depending on this, this comes from some underlying preference model again. Like now, earlier we were assuming that there was a re reward model from which we see the noisy feedback of the arms. But now we have a underlying preference model through which this uh, preference feedback of which arm is the most likely likely to be picked which movie is more, more most likely to be picked in a subset that is that is being generated but definitely this underlying model is not known to the learner 
So I work a bit on this uh, uh, preference-based learning problems. And um, when this, uh, so assuming that, that there is some good arm in the hindsight, depending on the need of the system, whatever, some best movie, say, no matter which user comes in, they always want to see that movie or something like that, or some good, good item. We want to converge to that item as quickly as possible so that if we show that item to the user, that item is likely to be clicked more and more. So uh, that is going to generate us a lot of revenue. But we can't use the conventional media manner techniques for it. We need different techniques. So I, I sort of work a bit on that. So somebody is interested. And uh, see, there's a lot of literature on preference bandits, or when, in particular, this uh, arm size k. Like we pull instead of a subset, we pull only two arms, and we see which arm beats the other arm. Uh, just pairwise comparisons. Uh, that literature is famously studied as dwelling bandit literature for last twenty years almost. So this is also a very well studied literature. And given below the uh, link of a GitHub repository where all the um, nice algorithms of dealing manders are implemented. Uh, here is also like, I'll just take uh, maybe one more minute. So uh, there is also another very interesting setup, which is called a reinforcement learning setup. So, so far we were seeing that uh, at every point, there are some actions we can take, some N actions, and each action has a fixed reward. Like if I play arm I, that the reward is generated from some underlying distribution of uh, expected mean mu i but here here uh, the player is this yellow ball which is eating eating the points but the thing is uh, this yellow ball has like four options actions to take at every round it, it can go up it can go down it can go left or right so four ac actions but you see the reward corresponding to this four actions are very different depending on which state it is in so now the reward is no longer fixed the new reward depends on the state uh, so this is this is a, this does not fall in the realm of or this setup cannot be captured through reinforcement learning anymore, uh, through through bandits anymore. We need more sophisticated problem formulation. We need a more richer for problem formulation, which is called the reinforcement learning problem, where it's the same as bandits, but it's general because now the rewards depends on which state the learner is in. So similarly, this is very, very useful and really used a lot, especially now in deep reinforcement learning to train models, to train robots, because you see the robot basically is trying to move forward, but it has to bend, it has to uh, slow down depending on what obstacles it is facing at particular round. So depending on which state it is in, it has to, the similar actions can give him different rewards. Uh, similarly, like designing drones, making the drones work, or balancing tasks, or online uh, delivery, like you know, delivery through drones. These things are very, these things are very prevalent. Actually, they are trying to, they are being used in the literature and even in the real world. So it's a very interesting uh, domain of study, the reinforcement learning problem. And uh, definitely we need like more sessions to cover these topics. These are like really uh, literature which has which are being studied for several many years. But if someone is interested and can check the links which I'm giving below here. And uh, these are basically the Python implementation links. And um, here is a link of a particular website which covers all the multi arm bandit algorithms in a very detailed fashion. And there is also a book link by the same authors who has a blog. And the book is very detailed and it thoroughly covers all realms of multi arm bandits and probably also gives some pointers to reinforcement learning. So if someone is interested, please do have a look. Mm -hmm. So that's all uh, I wanted to cover in the talk. So gambling is fun, all we know that, but it robs our money. So <laughs> it's, it's like a bandit problem. And uh, we saw some of the algorithms which can efficiently solve the bandit problem if the underlying rewards are stochastic, if the underlying rewards are adversarial, still we are not hopeless. We can come up with something. There are numerous extensions and generalizations which are possible. And we saw two of them, a preference bandits and reinforcement learning, but there are many more. So if someone wants to explore, please go ahead. Um, there's also some links that would be available in my website. So if someone wants to explore more on bandits or preference bandits on reinforcement learning. My website will also ha have some link. And if you have any question, please feel free to write me. And Amazing. thank you so much.
Thank you, Adaruba. So we do have one question in the chat, and I'll just let you know that I'm, we are a little bit over time, but yeah. that's okay. Uh, if anyone has more questions, please leave them in the chat. And right now, a question from Victor is, what if rewards are stochastic, but mean of distribution is infinite? Is UCB applicable? Uh, um, it, so if one of the arm has a infinite mean, which is a good good case for us, okay, because generally if that arm has an infinite mean, that means that whenever we are going to pull a sample, if it is a finite variance, even if it is a finite variance, we're going to see very high rewards for that arm. So definitely that arm's empirical mean is going to shoot up to a very high value very, very quickly. So UCB is definitely definitely applicable. UCB might not uh, converge to, the, the mean estimate might not converge to infinity, but the upper confidence bound will, will always be higher. Uh, so we'll eventually we'll always go on pulling that arm. Uh, but, um, I, I do not really see any technicalities, any any such technicalities which will happen if some of the arm has an infinite, infinite arm reward, though it's not really realistic, like it cannot have infinite rewards, but it is perfectly applicable, yeah. Uh, I think that answers the question. Perfect. Um, we don't have any more questions just yet, but if anyone does, uh, oh, sorry, Victor just followed up. He also says, multiple arms, different infinite means? Uh, so we assume that every arm has distinct mean because otherwise, how would you define the regret? So if multiple arms, so suppose we are in a multi-arm banded scenario where all the arms has a mean of 10. Uh, so there is nothing to learn. I mean, even if we don't know the rewards, we can pull any of the arm and we are we are good because we are we are getting the same reward. So it doesn't matter which arm we are we are converging to. So the multi arm bandit problem is only interesting if there is a particular arm sitting in the hind side which has the highest reward and the goal is to identify it. If there are multiple arms which has infinite rewards, uh, we can play either of them. I mean, I think like it is it is just okay to assume, uh, converge, merge all those arms into one super arm and assume like that's like one arm. So if there are two arms which has similar reward, theoretically we can merge them and have assume it like pretend it to be a single arm and solve the problem because eventually no matter whether we pull arm two or arm one if both has a similar reward it doesn't matter uh, performance wise so if they have like multiple arm has some single uh, infinite rewards we are good enough we can merge them into one arm or we can play it like that uh, all the arms will have very high ucb but the algorithm should work Perfect. He also has a follow-up. If multiple arms have different infinite rewards, regret might be infinite if you pick one over the other. Uh, so firstly, we assume, that's why I was saying, so firstly, we assume that every every arm's reward has, it's it's like a bounded zero, one or zero to hundred. So in that way, you should always assume that whenever we are trying to analyze a re regret, the arms are scaled down. So we, if if the arms are supposed in the rewards are in the range zero to some some twenty million, okay, and all the rewards are in the range zero to twenty million, we can scale it down to zero to one. Just divide everything by twenty million, and every every arm reward is in the scale zero to one. And now you do the reward analysis. If something is infinite, we don't have to like treat it as infinite. It could be infinite in the real world, but we can treat it like ten million or something. Um, with a very big number and then we can scale it down to zero to one and now we do the regret minimization task so what happens is these are like very extreme cases like these are like minute technicalities so if you have an infinite arm if you pull another arm which also has infinite reward then you incur like infinite minus infinite if it is defined it is zero but it is not defined so generally the idea is if we have infinite arm then you uh, you know, uh, replace it by a very large number, 10 million or 1000 million, and then scale everything to zero to one and then work with it. And that should work. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, since we're 10 minutes over now, if there are any more questions, you can please direct them to Adarupa on her email. Yeah. 
or um, that's AASA at Microsoft.com. And I'm sure she's happy to share her research and learnings there. Um, or on the website, I've pasted all the links that were on the slides in the chat. So you can find them out there. Um, oh, one last question, and then we'll wrap up. What if an ARM distribution changes during runtime? How will you identify this change? Yeah, so um, this is a basically the thing I was talking about. These things are very realistic. And the algorithm that I just mentioned, UCB and Thomson sampling, they are not doing it. But what we have to do is we also have to like, there has been studies uh, on this. So it's like non-stationary multi-arm bandits. If somebody wants to study it, just Google it out, non-stationary bandits, and they will find a bunch of literatures. Basically, the idea is to like have a restart model somewhere. So we proceed like uh, conventional bandits, but we also try to understand whether uh, the it seems like the distribution has changed much. So we have a we have a mean distribution of e mean of every arm. We'll keep on uh, computing the mean for different subintervals. If it looked like the mean looks very different compared to a previous subinterval, which should not happen if the underlying model was stationary. But if it is non-stationary in different subintervals, the mean will look very different. So then you will be that will be like a trigger, a red flag that the distribution has changed. So you should restart the model and uh, start ahead the UCB or Thompson sampling. So that's the way to go about it, high level. But uh, more technicalities would be there in the in the literature, you would see the book or you can search it on non-stationary bandits, you'll find it. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Adiruba. Thank you for joining us and thank you for all the attendees for dealing with our technical issues um, yeah, and you know, running so a little bit over time as well. We yes. really appreciate it. Um, and thank you so much, Adiruba. Thank you for joining uh, thanks everyone. Thanks a lot, woman, and thanks everyone for your attention. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.